So what's the lessons and strategies that Africa can learn from the Caribbean on tourism, trade, as well as investment opportunities and logistics? A and C. These were some of the questions that industry professionals handled at uh, the panel dedicated to tourism, trade, telecoms and investment at uh, the three-day Africa-Arabian summit held last week in Barbados. Take a listen. We have historically had any number of discussions with carriers around what should be the opportunities for lift between African countries and here in the Caribbean. We've had a number of attempts. None of them have uh, been able to yield the kind of results that we're hoping for. But in the last year or so, I'd like to think that we've made a number of significant steps to be able to bring us closer to the thing that we've all been looking forward to. So I don't think that it gives any of us any pleasure when we need to be able to go to an African country or you coming to the Caribbean, many of you talk about having to spend 28 hours, 40 hours moving between the two regions, going through London, having to navigate the difficulties of transit visas in the US and in the UK. And so what we are hoping to be able to do is to identify where would be the points of reference that would be the starting points to originate airlift. We started conversations with Air Rwanda, we started conversations with Ethiopian Airways, we've had conversations with Etihad as well, and we've also had uh, uh, discussions with Kenya Airways. We have already signed air services agreements with Kenya and with Ghana. We shall be signing further air services agreements with our partners as we move forward, and that in itself will then lend to negotiations with our commercial partners. But airlift, as you know, and certainly from my, from my perspective, this is about about air services for cargo and for people. So the top and the bottom of the plane. And so discussions around trade and investment, the business relationships that give impetus for people to move between countries and between regions, that's the basic platform as well. And so I'm expecting that the collaboration between our countries and our region over the poor course of the coming weeks coming out of this conference, and of course with the support of the Africa Exim Bank, will lend itself to a platform that allows for trade to be increased between our two regions, business travel to be increase between our two countries and then as many of you who have come here before have said to me over the course of the last few days and some of you who are coming back for holiday a little later on in the year with your families that those things when combined will create the commercial case for airlift and for airlines to be able to say we are willing to fly a 133 seater plane across the Atlantic from a West African jurisdiction, from an East African jurisdiction, and potentially, hopefully also, onward to the United States so that we have a strong commercial basis on which we can proceed. Issue of logistics to ensure that we have a dedicated carrier between our two regions is as crucial today as it should have been a couple of years ago. Uh, thankfully, there's a lot of cooperation agreements that are being signed uh, to ensure that we see some degree of dedication in terms of uh, transport, air transport between our two regions. What would drive it is really the investment that we're able to make to ensure that we're shoring up trade between the two regions and tourism uh, between the two regions. I think governments uh, across the divide must put our money where our mouth is. We must make the right investments and we must provide the incentives. And the private sector as well, um, while government is making the investment into those areas, the private sector also needs to complement the capacity building that the government's put in place to ensure that they also see and seek opportunities that are you know, available in this sector. We are not going to be able to do this if we do not have a commercial case for it. The reason why it has not been successful all these years is because there's not been a viable economic commercial case for it. And so we have to look at it from that standpoint. And I'm very encouraged by the approach that the Afro-Exim Bank is taking, the practical approach to see that we are actually putting deals on the table. Yep. Uh, and that's the way that, because any carrier who knows that there's um, frequent you know, movement on the corridor, would, would put a, a, a vessel, an aircraft on the, on, the, on, the, on the corridor. But if there is no commercial case, 
I don't see how that happens. And I'm encouraged also by the fact that the current heads of state of the AU are putting, gathering a lot of momentum for the implementation of the African continental free trade area. We see the importance of the synergy. You know, we see that it is extremely important. Um, in Africa, we have the great numbers. And I always say, I mean, it's a conversation I've had with airlines in terms of, you know, um, when they ask, okay, so what, I mean, what is, is the benefit, you know, how can we, we be sure that we will get our money's worth if we do have, you know, exchange. Africa has the numbers, that is number one. Nigeria alone, you know, is a people of, you know, over 200 million people. So, um, and um, what we've always advocated, even within, you know, the sub-region of West Africa and Africa at large, and then, you know, taking the Caribbean, and the, in fact, the African diaspora at large, you know, with it, we believe if we trade between ourselves, we, you don't even need any other, you know, um, continent or any other, you know, place to actually travel. We have, you know, enough numbers. So um, I believe this is the time, this is very key for us, you know, that this is happening at this time. You know, so when um, I have a meeting you know, later on with the doctor, you know, so we are already you know, strategizing on how to you know, make sure that we drive this forward. One thing that, um, in fact, I'm going to use this forum, and I, I thank Africa Zimbabwe because they have been taking the lead on that, is we need you know, strong you know, government policies. That is the difference between the Caribbean and Africa. And I always, you know, joke with my Caribbean friends as well, you guys have no choice. You have to make tourism work, that's all that you have. <laughs> You know, now, unfortunately, some of, some of the things that are a blessing to us in Africa has also um, been a hindrance. Because because we have so much going on and there's so much blessings, you know, governments have, you know, literally put, you know, tourism on the back burner. But there's been a lot of talks. I'm glad that, you know, my brother from Ghana is here. So we're going to make sure that we drive all this. So we need strong, you know, government policies, you know, that will also drive, you know, um, um, innovation from the private sector. But the private sector needs something to really encourage. I always tell people tourism is a private sector driven industry. We don't need to wait for governments, and we definitely do not wait for governments. However, we do need that policy, you know, and the infrastructure for tourism to, you know, um, thrive. So that's one thing that we're going to be learning a lot more with the Caribbean, you know, uh, from our end, our capacity building is also an issue. Um, we have a lot of tourism practitioners, but, you know, um, that know how to really understand what tourism really is, is very key. So these are the areas that, you know, we're working on and we're, you know, pushing on. Um, I'm going to seize this opportunity as well. We have, I mean, um, as an organization, there's a few, you know, um, projects that we have coming up. We're launching the West Africa, um, West, Af sorry, West Africa Ecotourism Network. It will be held in Ghana end of the year. So I think that is also a platform to get the Caribbean to actually come. So we're going to, you know, initiate um, a trade tourism you know, visits, you know, and, you know, public exchange. So um, we're going to, you know, put out the invitation to actually make this probably the first one that we'll get the Caribbeans to come, you know, into, you know, Africa. And it's not, though we're having the launch in Ghana, but we'll make sure that, you know, we do show you a few more, more um, um, country, uh, countries in the same block, you know, so we'll probably do something like Ghana, you know, Togo, Benin, and Nigeria, so that's four countries, you know, so at least you will see, and I think that will kickstart the, you know, uh, relationship. One key element is payment. Um, trade doesn't happen without payments. Uh, tourism, <laughs> when people move, they have to be able to spend. You know, investment is also the movement of funds. So clearly, if we do not have payments sorted, then the integration that we would like to have may not happen. Now, we begin to look at Africa, we begin to look at the diaspora Africa, and we say to ourselves that it's important that this payment infrastructure that will drive trade, that will drive investment, and of course, uh, Prof talked about uh, in intra-Caribbean and African marriages. When that happens, you know, um, you know, payment is also involved. 
So clearly, everything that we do in life is about we create content, we consume some of them, and we exchange some with the rest of the world. And the only way we exchange them is payments. So what has PAPS done? PAPS has um, created a payment rail that will be able to guarantee that member states are able to trade with each other in their domestic currencies. And what that will do is begin to lower that hunger for third party global currencies. So we've said to ourselves, can we look at payment and trade? How can we bring more efficiency to payments? If payments take five to seven days to clear and settle, if we bring it down to one day, or in our own case, 120 seconds, what that means is it's going to allow businesses more time to be able to trade and to turn around their inventory, okay? So what we've done basically is to put in place a world-class payment infrastructure that is able to clear and settle transactions in local currencies that cuts out all those expensive correspondent banking relationships. Uh, it's like, uh, and I, I talked about a simple idea uh, in my last uh, uh, panel discussion. If today, when we travel, in traveling from Lagos to Accra, we don't first of all travel somewhere halfway around the world before going to Accra. <laughs> we don't ship goods that way. We don't communicate that way. Why should money travel those parts? So we think that by bringing efficiency to payments, okay, we can actually accelerate trade, accelerate tourism. When people travel, they want to spend, and they want to know that those transactions can be settled.